Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to everyone to this uh, event jointly organized by the Asian Development Bank and the Islamic Development Bank for the 52nd session of the United Nations Statistical Commission. My name is uh, Joseph Maria Singham, statistician with the Asian Development Bank and your host for today's session titled Measuring Economic Globalization Beyond Trade. As we emphasize the prominence and significance of economic linkages across borders, we are glad to have here with us participants from around the world. Now, it is my honor to invite Dr. Bambam Susantano, Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, Asian Development Bank, to officially open this proceeding. Dr. Susantano, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Joseph. Hello, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good day to everyone. It is my real pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on economic globalization statistics. I would like first to acknowledge Vice President Mansur Mohtar, my colleagues, his support to the long-standing partnership between the Asian Development Bank and the Islamic Development Bank. Today's co-organization is on the topic of statistical analysis for development, specifically on how best to measure economic globalizations beyond trade. It is an area that ADB and ISDB have been working on together for some time. I would like to warmly welcome the representative of the National Statistical Systems participating in this 52nd UN Statistical Commission session. I commend you for your critical role in promoting evidence-based policy making and also in evaluating the progress toward achieving the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. The SDGs are ambitious. A country's ability to use this goal as a means to create transformative development results depends a great deal on reliable data and their sharp analysis. Better data help identify evolving issues and assess SDG progress. Today's event is part of our initiative to develop good SDG data to back policy analysis through global value chain-led economic growth. Global value chains or GVC statistics measure the value created in each economy through its participations in globalized production processes. We have seen how gaps in data and analytics can lead to policy decisions that trap developing countries in lower value chain segments. Ultimately, this results in their failure to capture the benefit of GVC linkages. In this regard, I want to highlight the critical role played by economic globalization statistics in shaping key policy decisions, especially those in, on industrial upgrading through GVC participations. GVCs allow economies to participate in globalized supply chains in a beneficial manner. Although this requires varying levels of technological and process sophistications, it becomes relatively easy when specializing in production segments where economies hold a comparative advantage. Once countries join the GVCs, they tend to be able to raise their technical capacity over time. These countries will then be able to localize productions of additional GVC components, thereby augmenting their gross domestic product. For many economies, GVC has been instrumental in driving technology transfer, which facilitates their technological progress. As countries become more integrated in GVCs, their firms become more efficient. This change is driven by the increased demands to upgrade technology and meet international standards. Firms connected to GVCs also tend to be more innovative and offer greater skills development. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, evidence show that GVCs enhance labor welfare. This increased labor demand has resulted not only in greater workforce participation of women, but also in greater gender wage parity globally. We also see better working conditions and higher wages as labor welfare standards are applied throughout GVCs. Further, globalization has increased the awareness of environmental issues and climate change. There is no more impetus for businesses, especially those in GVCs, to produce eco-friendly products under eco-friendly conditions. As governments see these benefits and their impact on growth and development, they have been re-evaluating and refocusing their investment in education and skills development. This is especially true in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
Evidence shows that countries that invest in building relevant skills as a long-term strategy will not only succeed in attracting GVC segments, but also move up to higher income GVC segments over time. This leads me to conclude that integrating firms into GVCs, particularly the micro, small, and medium-sized ones, offer a new prospect for long-term inclusive and sustainable development and industrializations, and by extension, achieving the SDGs. We all know by now that Asia and the Pacific is off track in meeting any of the 17 SDGs, and this challenge has been further deepened in 2020 after the COVID-19 pandemic struck. But do we know exactly which of the 169 targets need what kind of interventions by policymakers in each country? The truth is that absence of critical data often hinders us from coming up with such diagnostic. This is one of the most basic challenges for achieving the SDGs in our regions. So let me come back to the vital role you play as statistician in providing valuable evidence, especially in today's context of heightened uncertainties. The experience in the past year has taught us that with two thirds of global production being organized in GVCs, disruptive events in one part of the chains affect that entire production network. It has happened numerous times during the COVID-19 pandemic. For greater resilience of GVCs, there is a compelling need to engage policymakers in statistical analysis to mitigate negative effect or even to take advantage of the restructured threat linkages. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, under the broad scheme of helping our developing members to better participate in GVCs, ADB is offering technical assistance and knowledge support. This will accelerate progress toward achieving SDG targets. We also work with our partners at UNDP and UNSCAP to monitor SDG progress across the region and publish our findings annually in the three-part reports. Over the years, ADB has been supporting projects that reinforce existing value chains and develop new value chains linkages between domestic corridors. Our lending projects include the Greater Mekong Subregion Economic Corridor Development, the Alma Tibiskek Economic Corridor Program as part of the CARIC 2030 strategy, and the Fisakap Patnam Chennai Industrial Corridor Development Program under the South Asia Subregional Economic Corporations, or SASEC. Operational Plan 2016 to 2025. This work is all part of ADP Strategy 2030, which is fully aligned with the SDGs and also promotes greater regional cooperation and integration as one of its seven operational priorities. ADB is also working closely with the public and private institutions to build effective statistical and analytical capacities to track progress toward the SDGs. We are committed to bridging data gaps and providing relevant knowledge products to complement local and international initiatives, including those related to GVC participations. We also assist the MCs assess progress toward measuring the benefits and risks of participating in GVCs. This brings us to the context of our sessions today. We will be exploring conceptual and methodological issues in three critical areas that have implications for global value chain participation, namely exchange rates, localizations, and digitalizations. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by inviting all of you to actively participate in this event. All of you play an important part in building back better toward achieving the SDGs and during the recovery of our region's economies. I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Susantano, for your very inspiring and ins insightful speech that has set the tone for the session. Now it is my honor to invite Dr. Mansoor Mukta, Vice President for Country Program and Acting Chief Product Officer, Islamic Development Bank, to deliver the welcome speech. Dr. Mukta, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Dr. Bamban Susantano, for setting the context for our discussions. And a very well, warm welcome, well, a very warm greetings from Jeddah. And thank you for joining us, joining us today. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the United Nations 
Statistical Commission side event organized jointly by the Islamic Development Bank and the Asian Development Bank on measurement issues related to the economic globalization phenomenon. I'm happy to note that the collaboration between our two institutions, which started in the operational domain, has now been extended to knowledge areas as well, encompassing economic and statistical research and analysis. This knowledge partnership, which resulted in country diagnostic studies on Indonesia and Pakistan, has been further broadened and deepened with ongoing joint initiatives related to the system of national accounts, the system of environmental accounts, tourism satellite accounts, and statistics on economic globalization, or GBCs. In particular, the research work on GBCs, which in 2019 produced a statistical study on Indonesia's participation in cross-border production arrangements, now covers all ISDB ADB common member countries. At a time when the COVID pandemic is redefining supply chains and production networks, such studies assume even greater significance for fact-based economic monitoring and evidence-based policy making. Although traditional trade has been known to transcend political boundaries and physical barriers for millennia, GBCs are a relatively new phenomena, which started taking root in the 1990s. Propelled by the rapid developments in production, information, communication, and transportation technologies, and catalyzed by progressive removal of policy barriers to trade, especially after establishment of the World Trade Organization in 1995, enterprises have been able to fragment and modularize production processes and distribute them globally to take advantage of location-specific endowment advantages, thereby reducing cost and increasing value. The proliferation of global production networks seen since the early 1990s has been compounded by the ever-evolving economic environment an environment that is becoming increasingly complex due to various factors and phenomena, such as market and policy actions, product and production innovations, systemic and external shocks. This has necessitated timely and actionable research and analysis. The joint ISDD ADD knowledge initiative is designed to study the multifaceted aspects of economic globalization through standard and cutting edge statistical and analytical frameworks and methods. In this seminar, our analysts and research partners will present the results of our work related to three key factors with implications for economic globalization, namely real effective exchange rates, agglomeration and digitalization. Our statistical and economic research work are also operationally relevant. The ISDB promotes and supports participation in GBCs as a development strategy. This focus on value chains allows the bank to prioritize its projects in areas with highest impact, and at the same time, provide greater opportunity for countries to be interconnected through GBCs. The banks move in championing value chains in its member countries supports the agenda of doubling manufacturers' share of GDP by 2030 and allows markets to mobilize resources for development. In this event, we will look at one such area, the automotive sector. The globalization of value chains and production networks pose many key measurement and analytical challenges. Multilateral knowledge partners are being forced to collectively bridge the important data and analytical gaps in the understanding of the state and evolution of GBC participation of various country sectors. One such partnership involving the ADB, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, UNSCAP, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, UN ECLAC, 
expanded the relevant statistical frameworks and produced rigorous analysis to discern the evolving cross-border border production arrangements between East Asia and Latin America. The results of this study will also be presented and discussed today. As noted earlier, the pandemic is having a telling impact on global supply chains. The COVID effect in conjunction with other relevant factors and phenomena present a serious measurement challenge to the statistical community. The ISDB and the ADB are committed to supporting statistical research and analysis for eliminating current and emerging economic issues so as to facilitate evidence-based policy making and measurement of progress towards development goals. The event is part of our ongoing operationally relevant knowledge initiatives in the GVC domain. We look forward to your active engagement and participation in this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mansur Mukta, for your very insightful speech. Uh, it has actually described the purpose for of and the motivation for this webinar. So we now move on to the first segment of the session. It is titled Multidimensional Aspects of Economic Globalization Statistics. Uh, for this, may I invite Dr. Yasuki Sawada, Chief Economist and Director General, Asian Development Bank, to moderate this segment. Uh, Dr. Sawada, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, as Vice President Santono and Vice President Muhta noted, a uh, full understanding of economic globalization phenomena requires not only in-depth analysis of trade data, trade linkages, and trade relationship, but also comprehensive study of various economic, technological, political, and social elements influencing economic specialization and uh, trade. Uh, statistical compilation and analysis related to such factors, in addition, uh, fostering a better understanding of global system facilitates evidence-based policy making and also monitoring progress towards development goals. In this segment, members of Asian Development Bank uh, GD, GVC team will be presenting results of our ongoing statistics and uh, statistical and anal analytical work on three issues, relative effective exchange rates, localization and agglomeration, and digital economy. So these three subjects mat matter areas critically related to uh, evolution of global value chain, especially in the economic environment uh, redefined by COVID-19. So now let's move on to um, our presentations. Our first presenter is uh, Mr. Kenneth Reyes, Research Associate, Statistics and Data Innovation Unit, SDIU of uh, ADB. Kenneth received his master's degrees in economics from the University of the Philippines and also the University of Tokyo. Apart from his work with the Asian Development Bank, he has worked on research projects with Philippine Department of Finance and Asian Institute of Management. He is also a part-time lecturer at the Ateneo de Manila University. I now uh, would like to invite uh, uh, Kenneth Reyes to present his work on real effective exchange rates. Uh, Kenneth, the uh, floor is yours and you have uh, 15 minutes. Hi, thank you. Let me just share my screen now. Hi, good evening from Manila. I'm very happy to kick off this side event uh, with the UNSC. I will be talking about our ongoing research on real effective exchange rates and how they may be incorporated into GVC research. Real effective exchange rates are actually a very uh, classic indicator in international macroeconomics. But as I will discuss, they have some limitations because of the kind of data that they use. This uh, presentation will cover the following things. First, I'll give a brief introduction to what the rear is, how is it computed, what is it supposed to measure, and what does it mean. I'll give uh, the basic formula that gives the rear. And then I'm going to talk about recent literature that proposes alternatives to how the rear may be measured. Um, 
I'll be talking in particular about two papers, one from Benson Johnson, 2017, and one from Nikhil Patel, uh, Wang, and Wei, 2019. Using this, I will apply um, these formulas to the ADB MRIO data set um, and the resulting um, rears um, I will present in uh, some preliminary findings. What do they say? What kind of insights do they give about the world? And then I'll cover briefly some ongoing and future work that we are currently working on. The rear is essentially a price index that measures an economy's prices relative to its trade competitors. By convention, um, when it goes down, we call it a depreciation. And that means that the home economy's prices have become more competitive relative to the competitor's prices, vice versa for an appreciation. In this way, it can be viewed as an inverse competitiveness index in the sense that if the rear goes down, that means the economy has become more competitive in the global environment. Um, this indicator, like I said, has a long pedigree in macroeconomics. It is most associated with the IMF as part of their uh, international monitoring system because the rear can give a lot of information about uh, future trajectories in the trade balance of countries because, because, because it may be an inverse competitiveness index. If it goes down, the country may expect a higher trade balance and vice versa. So it's very uh, illuminating to keep track of this indicator. How is it computed? To illustrate this, let me give a very simple example. Let's say that there are three economies in the world. The change in the rear of economy A will look something like this. Um, it is a function of three things, the prices of economy A, um, the prices of economy B, and the prices of economy C. The, these prices are then weighted by these numbers here, alpha and one minus alpha, such that any change in prices of uh, other countries will result in a change in the index for the rear of economy A. The weights naturally have to sum to uh, one for economy A and one for all the other economies. Why is this? Because if all prices change the same proportion, let's say 1%, 2%, um, theory would dictate that the rear of economy A should not change. Basically, the, um, the uh, basic uh, assumption in economics. So that's why we require that the weights totally would sum to zero, and for all the foreign economies would sum to one or a negative one. Here's a very quick example to illustrate what this means. Suppose that the prices of economy B went up by 5%. The resulting rear change for economy A will be 5% multiplied by the weight assigned to economy B, which is negative alpha. So the total change to rear A is negative alpha 5%. The weight is a function of how much A and B compete. So the more they compete, the more their value added competes, the greater this weight should be because the more economy B would matter for the competitiveness of economy A. In matrix notation, it's uh, like this. The reason why we want to express them in matrix notation is because it makes implementation easier. So at the end of the day, what we are after is how to apply theory into practice. And to do this, um, it's far easier to express all these notations in matrices. The computation of the weights matrix over here is the primary challenge in rear models, as I will discuss. Um, before I move on, let me just go through quickly some conventions that I use for notation. For every variable x, there will be subscripts that indicate the flow, the direction of flow from one entity to another. It should be read from left to right such that uh, xru is saying that this is the variable x, which is flowing from entity r to entity u. If there's just one subscript, then that is an aggregate. So that's entity r. Um, aggregated to all its buyers. So the rear, or uh, what I will call here the conventional rear, which is most associated with how the IMF uh, computes it, although not exactly the same, um, boils down to this formula. 
it composes of uh, two um, components. Um, we have this fraction here, which is the share. Oh, by the way, this is going to be the rear that the economy R assigns to economy S, okay, or the weight assigned to them. Um, and this will be a function of two fractions. First, the share of U in R sales, or how important market U is for economy R. And secondly, the market share of S in U. So how important S is to uh, market U. And then we sum it across all markets U to get the weight assigned by R to S. These are the two components that this function uh, comprises of. Now, um, a criticism that was brought up by Benson Johnson was that this weight uh, formula relies on trade statistics, which makes the implicit assumption that all trade is in final goods, which of course uh, the, is increasingly untenable um, in an age where global value chains have become more prevalent. But this formula does not take into account imported inputs. So two alternatives um, is, uh, are currently implemented by um, our team uh, they come from two papers uh, from Bamson Johnson and Patel Wang and Wei. The BJ rear, which was proposed by Bamson Johnson, builds a partial equilibrium model with uniform elasticities. Um, the crux of the model is that gross trade flows are adjusted to take into account value added flows. So if A uses B's inputs, then B's prices should affect A's competitiveness, even if they do not have any direct com competition. So if the Philippines, for example, um, if we were to discuss its rear relative to say uh, Malaysia, um, even if um, the Philippines and say Vietnam don't directly compete, if Vietnam uses, uh, if Malaysia uses um, inputs from Vietnam, then we would want to take that into account when thinking about Philippines competition with uh, in the global environment. Um, so the BJ rear takes this into account. The PWW rear, which comes from Patel and Wang and Wei, is an extension of this that differentiates um, the sector origin of price changes. So it takes into account sector heterogeneity, um, looks into which sectors in particular um, these economies are competing in. So here's uh, some of the results that we found when implementing these three formulas, the conventional rear, the BJ rear, and the PWW rear. Um, here's a example economy, Singapore. The weights, as you can see, are different um, depending on which formula you use. Um, notably, if you look at the weight of China, um, that Singapore assigns, the weight of China is noticeably larger when we take into account input trade because, of course, China or the, the PRC is a very much a strong supplier of inputs in other countries. So even if countries do not necessarily compete head-to-head -head with China, they may do so through the value added that PRC embeds in final goods. Here's another example, Malaysia. Again, PRC has a larger weight when inputs are taken into account. And the resulting rears is uh, presented here for Singapore and Malaysia. Um, as you can see, the conventional rear tends to, at least for these two countries, it tends to overestimate the rate of depreciation of the rears of these two countries. Once um, the input trade is taken into account, the actual depreciation um, becomes smaller. Another way we can uh, look at this is to decompose where uh, the changes in the rear is coming from, be it from the domestic inflation of these economies or the exchange rate appreciation of these economies. The law of one price states that inflation and exchange rate appreciation should cancel each other out if prices were the same across the, country, across the world. But obviously in, the, uh, in practice, this is not always the case. So the dots that you see is where the rear um, falls. And uh, law of one price would say that it's just going to be zero. But in fact, we do not see this in the data. All right, 
Now, one question, one interesting question we may ask is, what is the relationship of the rear to GVCs? Because um, in the literature, it is emphasized that currencies must be kept as stable as possible because this is going to be conducive to growth. So the question is, how does GVC participation reduce volatility? On the one hand, you might say that it reduces it because it diversifies risk across different trading partners. But at the same time, you might say that it increases volatility because you, know, you increase your exposure to more supply chains. Um, just looking at the data, this is the snapshot of how volatile rears are across the world. You might notice that economies that specialize in commodities exports, oil exports, tend to have more volatile rears. On the other end, economies in the EU, by sharing a currency, tend to have uh, less volatile rears. But let's uh, look at how GVC participation can change things. So I, I measure GVC participation in two ways uh, based on the literature. One looks at GVC trade as a ratio of GDP, which is based on the Wang Wei Yu and Ju GVC participation. I call this part V. Um, the other way is to look at GVC trade as a ratio of gross exports as based from Boren and Mancini. I call this part X. I apply this to the ADB MRIO data set and I get this. This one uses the Wang Wei Yu and Ju participation measure, part V. We see that uh, while the mean GVC participation um, does not seem to have any effect, the change across the period has a, a dampening effect on volatility. Um, the opposite is the case for the Bored and Mancini uh, conception of participation, part X. The mean of measure, uh, participation has a dampening effect on um, volatility. The change also does, but it's the, the data is too noisy. It's not statistically significant. Um, so these regressions are highly preliminary. Uh, you notice that we don't really have um, any controls yet, but these are just meant to be indicative. There does seem to be some correlations and it's worth exploring further how strong these are. Um, some possible explanations include, like I said, um, GVC trade may allow economies to diversify across uh, trading partners. There might also be a euro, a euro effect, so it might be worth uh, controlling for membership in the EU. Now to conclude my presentation, let me just go through some of the ongoing and future work that uh, we are currently doing. Um, one is, of course, to implement the sector level rears of the PWW rear. This formula actually allows us to compute sector level rears as opposed to just economy level rears that are typically reported uh, by the IMF. We also want to explore the correlation that I just showed. What underlies it? What are the mechanisms? How robust is this result? And we also want to look at how the rear can or cannot predict exports growth or the trade balance. Which rear formula uh, is the strongest predictor for the trade balance? And of course, we want to look at other correlations with other GVC indicators. Um, I'm talking about production length, uh, upstreamness, and so on. So the data is rich, and uh, we have a lot of work um, ahead of us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth, for a really um, um, a great presentation. Uh, this is a very important variant to the standard method for calculating a RIA or a real effective uh, exchange rate. And uh, uh, RIA is uh, one of the most cited statistical construct in open macro uh, economics. And I thought that this is a very, very important, uh, uh, you know, uh, uncovering a nexus between GVC participation and uh, Aria volatility. I thought that this is a really uh, a nice presentation. Um, now, before moving to a second presenter, uh, for participants, please uh, write down your comments and questions on uh, Q&A box so that we can um, uh, consolidate all the questions together and have a, a session uh, after three presentations. So now uh, let's move on to um, our next speaker, uh, Ms. Christina Baris. Uh, research Associate, Statistics and Data Innovation Unit, ADB. 
Christina has been a research associate for ADB since the year 2018 with expertise in international trade, global value chain, and the energy capacity building. For over six years, Christina has also held a variety of positions in energy consulting, uh, project management, research, and community uh, engagement. Prior ex experience was with the uh, Development Bank of the Philippines and IBM uh, Philippines. She holds a, a Bachelor of Science in Management from Ateneo de Manila University, and also a double master's degree in international business and economics from University of uh, Pavia in Italy and uh, Strasbourg University in France. So now uh, I'd like to invite uh, Christina uh, to present her work on the topic of uh, agglomeration of production uh, activities leading to localization. So again, um, uh, Christina, you have 15 minutes uh, for your presentation. Uh, Christina, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. So let me just share my screen. Okay. I believe I'm sharing my screen now, so I'll start. Yes, uh, we can see uh, your um, uh, presentation clearly and you can hear you clearly. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So today I'm happy to be sharing our study on measuring agglomeration and the degree of clustering of sectors of production activities in a globalized environment. So the contribution of our study in literature is twofold. First, we offer some preliminary evidence of the extent of domestic agglomeration, which is in a way the extent of localization in Asian economies. And then second, our study suggests that at the developing stages of the economy, there's a need to promote a degree of clustering or agglomeration of domestic sectors, but that at the later stages, linking to GVCs contribute more to growth. Now, here's our motivation for doing this study. First is that pronouncements on countries' competitiveness and long-term growth prospects usually rely on trade data, but trade data give us a limited view of what is happening within the domestic economy. And second, we want to clarify the extent of domestic agglomeration, which again is in a way localization across economies. And the third is we hope that this study serves as a starting point for an informed conversation on domestic agglomeration as a factor for value added growth, productivity, comparative advantage, with a view to informing policymaking in production and trade. So this is our agglomeration index. Our agglomeration index summarizes a sector's level of interaction with other sectors, domestic or foreign. And we base it on two perspectives. The first is backward in terms of supply. And the second is agglomeration based on forward linkages in terms of demand. Essentially, what our agglomeration index suggests is the economy sector's a requirement of intermediate inputs from a great number of uh, domestic or foreign sectors and uh, at what quantities. Now, a parallel information can be made for the forward agglomeration. So a high estimate of agglomeration based on forward linkages would indicate that the economy sector supply intermediate outputs to a great number of domestic or foreign sectors and at large quantities. So simply put, the economist agglomeration index summarizes the degree of clustering or the agglomeration of sectors within an economy. And then at the sector level, it measures the depth and the breadth of linkages one sector has with other sectors. But to examine how successful economies are in capturing the value added benefits through these sectoral linkages, we also produce the value agglomeration index and we measure it as the domestic share of value added induced by a unit shock in a domestic or foreign sector's final demand. So essentially economies with high value agglomeration are the economies that are able to derive 
high value added gains from sectoral linkages. So let's begin at looking at the results. Uh, we see here the trends of globalization and domestic agglomeration. We see from the chart on the left here that from the 1990s to the 2008, the period of hyper-globalization of supply chains is giving way to the rise of globalization, the period from 2008 onwards when global trade slows pace dramatically. And at the same time, we see that domestic agglomeration gradually rose beginning 2004 for upper middle income economies, as you can see here on the chart on the right. So what we find is that local turns towards the domestic sectors were already underway for some economies even before the trade conflict or even the COVID-19 pandemic began. But its disruption in global supply chains has sort of accelerated this shift. Now let's start examining the state of domestic linkages across economy sectors using our agglomeration index. So the columns of larger dots highlighted in the vertical blue bars indicate the economies with a strong agglomeration across most sectors. So these include the US and the more advanced East Asian economies of Japan, the PRC and Republic of Korea. And also we find that PRC reports the highest domestic agglomeration based on backward and forward linkages across all, all manufacturing and service sectors. And the other finding is that overall, the services sectors posted the highest domestic agglomeration. Now we look at value agglomeration. Again, we we'll do this to, to see how successful economies are in capturing the value added benefits through sectoral linkages. And to do this, we plot the backward and then the forward value agglomeration. And this is jointly here in this plot. The two dotted lines here indicate the world average backward and forward value agglomeration. And we can see from here that most high income economies, those are your red dots, fall above your 45 degree line. So this means that high income economies enjoy high domestic value added gains from their backward linkages, while the low income economies represented by your blue dots here have lower value agglomeration, implying lower induced value added increases from their sectoral linkages. Now here we see that the services sectors, the charts here at the bottom, show high backward and forward agglomeration, especially your business services here in the middle. So these uh, business services sectors tend to be in the upper right corner. So this means that the services sectors tend to gain high domestic value added from sectors, from other sectors growth, and also that they supply high value added to those sectors linked to it. And in comparison to the services sector, we see that the value agglomeration for your medium and high technology manufacturing sectors here in the upper right chart are more scattered. So we see that the value added that these sectors spill over to other sectors are higher for more advanced economies and lower for your low income economies. Again, here you see in the blue dots. And the electrical sector, for example, is an early example of this unequal distribution of value added gains across economies. Here we see that the indices are high with a rising trend for Malaysia, PRC, Korea, light blue, Taipei, China, yellow. But for Mexico, the trend line in green exhibits a declining value agglomeration index indicating lower domestic value added gains in Mexico's production. So why such low and decreasing value agglomeration of Mexico? Uh, we see here the domestic agglomeration structure for Mexico, and we find that the central to this explanation may be the preliminary evidence for enclave sectors in Mexico. So in this dot plot matrix here, the columns and the rows are the domestic sectors of Mexico, the size of the dots provide a measure of our, uh, the, the, our value agglomeration index. And put simply, the more populated the plot is with larger circles, the more agglomerated, the more production economic activity is 
spread towards other sectors. So we find here that the value-added production in Mexico are concentrated in a few possibly enclave sectors of um, non-metallic minerals and machinery. So these are your columns with the larger dots highlighted in vertical blue bars. And these main sectors are supported by only one or two other sectors in the economy, the rows with the larger dots and, or the horizontal bars. So in these situations, the enclave sectors do not really integrate into the rest of the economy because their linkages are few and shallow. And now to contribute to the debate whether high domestic value added levels or DVA share should be an objective. We look at the DVA levels relative to world average. These are your dashed lines. And also the value agglomeration index measured across economies. These are your solid lines. Looking solely at your DVA levels relative to world average, it would seem that PRC, the red line here, posted the highest DVA levels. But Contrasting this with our value agglomeration index, the solid lines here, the US, the violet line here, not the PRC, has the highest capacity to gain domestic value added through sectoral linkages. And so, therefore, the ability to generate domestic value added and supply value added to domestic sectors cannot really be directly deduced solely by looking at your level of domestic value added supply and demand because though impressive, they do not provide a complete picture. Now we investigate the relationship between localization and development. So we apply a lowest estimator to domestic agglomeration and development proxied by LN GDP per capita. And as you can see here, we see visually a hump shaped relationship exists. So this tells us that economies do grow by increasing the depth of interaction among their domestic sectors by increasing their domestic agglomeration within the economy. But until such um, a turning point, and at such point, we see that the possibilities of domestic agglomeration are already exhausted or about to be exhausted, as you can see here on the chart on the left. And this is where foreign agglomeration or simply linking to GVCs play a more important role as seen by the U-shaped relationship here between agglomeration with foreign sectors and economic development. And so therefore, we see that localization strate strategies do work efficiently at the early economic stages when it's crucial to build the necessary network of linkages among your domestic sectors before integrating into the broader global production supply chains to maximize the potential benefits of participating in GVCs. And also we see that domestic agglomeration can lead to a lowering of total factor productivity, as you can see here on the chart on top, when your factors of production become limited to your domestic sources. But we also see that it may lead to greater competitiveness, greater comparative advantage and may push the creation of champion sectors. And here we see the, that linkages can play a complementary role. So how should economies increase value added gains? And we say that linkages is the key. So we see here that the higher the economy's domestic agglomeration, the more it is able to absorb value added gains through its linkages. So in short, domestic agglomeration is essential to maximize the absorptive capacities to gain value added from eventually linking or participating in GVCs. So now I'll just mention some caveats and limitations of the studies very quickly. First, uh, there's the aggregation bias, which we all encounter in all our studies. Second, we have um, we can infer employment linkages, but we cannot really see them directly. And then third is that admittedly, we can completely, we cannot completely rule out that there are other potential ex explanations that might generate the same patterns that we presented. So now I'll conclude by summarizing our findings. First, again, 
we saw that Asia's leading economies, the PRC, Japan, India, are turning local. And then second, we saw that the domestic agglomeration index is able to show the importance of domestic interlinkages within the economy for growth and comparative advantage. For example, the study brings into light the importance of the services sector that have high domestic agglomeration stand to gain and supply high domestic value added from other sectors growth through its linkages with other sectors. So in conclusion, the overall policy focus is to prevent enclave sectors and to create wider spillovers on developing ec economies. So ensuring that domestic agglomeration are deep and strong and that they maximize value added gains through linkages. And one clear message in the report is that localization or solely, solely focusing on promoting domestic value added within the economy fail to achieve higher growth and productivity uh, because as our results will show at the late, later stages of development, uh, foreign linkages or linking to GVCs contribute to economies development and productivity more. And so therefore localization as a complement but not a substitute. Okay, that concludes my presentation. I'll pass over the, the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Uh, I, I think uh, this is a very, very insightful uh, analysis and presentation. And uh, GVC, uh, sometimes it looks like a black box, I think, but I think uh, your presentation really uh, uh, provided uh, vivid uh, look into the black box of a GBC. So thank you, thank you very much. So uh, again, uh, for a participant, uh, please uh, type in your uh, questions. Uh, there are some uh, technical materials, so uh, uh, we would uh, welcome uh, clarifying questions and also comments. So now uh, let's move on to the uh, our uh, third presenters today, uh, An Angelo for this session today, Angelo Jose Lumba. Uh, he is Re Research Associate, Statistics and Data Innovation Unit of ADB. Angelo works on analysis of digital economy, foreign direct investment, and global value chain for ADB's uh, multi-regional input output table GVC uh, uh, team. Um, uh, he is a doctoral candidate of uh, economics at the University of the Philippines, Diliman campus, where he also obtained a master's of arts in the same field economics. His research experience includes in-depth study of GVC trend in Brunei, Dar es Salaam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, and, and also econometric analysis of uh, employment, inflation, tax evasions, and uh, MSMEs. That means the micro, small, and medium scale uh, enterprises in the Philippines, as well as socioeconomic surveys of coastal community in Southeast Asia. So now let's listen to uh, uh, Angelo's uh, presentation uh, on estimating digital economies contribution to global domestic product. Uh, Angelo, uh, floor is yours. And also you have 15 minutes. Thank you, Sawada-san. So I'm here to present our paper entitled The Core of the Digital Economy, a Proposed Framework which is actually a starting point for our full-blown research on the subject matter, which covers several fields. So a bit of a context. When we first began working on this research, my colleague and I, Clara, uh, looked into se several articles online as well as in books and journals. And we noticed that the authors working on the subject matter generally agreed on the growing importance and pervasiveness of digitalization phenomena. So it's pervasive in the sense that production processes now use more digital products along over time and some consumption behavior has changed over time uh, with regard to uh, the use of digital products in their everyday lives. And that actually was not meant, uh, th th that was not met with a consensus in terms of an established measurement framework for the digital economy, particularly how to measure its size and contributions to a given economy. And that may prove to be a bit problematic, especially when you're trying to do some comparative research across economies in years, because essentially your results might just be different and that becomes a function of the method that you're using. So then we set out on a journey and a goal. 
they're made up of four steps right here. First, we noticed that we had to define concretely what a digital economy is. And then using that particular definition, we will use that to identify what digital products and industries are. And then put that aside first, we will make a framework to measure the contributions of these digital industries to the overall economy. Then put all of those ingredients together and apply them to actual data to see if it actually makes sense when you use all of these. So let's first start with our working de definition of the digital economy. So here it is, it pertains to the contribution to GDP of any exchange or flow of economic value involving digital products and in industries. So this is quite a simple yet quite loaded um, definition right here. So we need to dissect this a bit further. Let's first focus on the term digital. So technically, it means information expressed in discrete values, including your ones and zeros binary code. And it's usually contrasted with the term analog, which refers to info expressed using a continuously variable physical quantity signal. That's with respect to time. So for example, you have your electromagnetic waves, and then in digital terms, you can express those electromagnetic waves in binary, ones and zeros. To, um, uh, transmit information. So let's use that uh, definition of digital list, use it as an adjective and attach it to the word products. And now you have um, a definition for digital products here, which are goods and services that serve the primary or the main function of generating, storing, and or processing digitized data. So using the UNSC CPC, we found core digital products to be summarized into five main product groupings here, hardware, software, data publishing, telecom, specialized and support services. So now that you have a definition of digital, digital products, you can now map out what industries primarily produce those digital products. And then whatever those are during your mapping exercise, you will call the main or the core digital industries. So if you're familiar with a supply table, that's actually quite easy to do. So a supply table is a, a soft dimension product by industry, right? So for every digital product that you've identified, look at the row that uh, it pertains to one of your digital products and get the maximum entry in that row. And then that will um, fall under a particular column. That column would be the main producer of that digital product that you're looking at. And then now you have one digital industry in your list. Do that for all the digital products that you have identified. And now you'll come up with a list of digital industries. So some considerations here that we have to take um, note of. So first, uh, components and accessories that comprise or support digital products and services, we don't consider that as main or core digital products. For example, you have semiconductors there. And the goods and services that use digital products as components or accessories are also not considered digital products as well. So why is that? Well, essentially, even though they form part of a product or service that performs the main um, functions of the, digital in of the digital products we have a while ago, it doesn't have serve the primary primary role or function of uh, producing, generating, and storing digital data. They only enable it, or they only use products that do those primarily. However, we promise that these contributions, um, as well as dependencies with the digital sector, are captured in our framework. So here are some methodological requirements that you need. So you need input output tables of dimension industry by industry, or alternatively, you can start off with product by industry supply and use tables, and you can just do some basic matrix operations, apply some formula, and you can uh, transform those SCTs to IOTs of industry by industry dimension. You also need to have at least um, some form of uniformity across your national tables. So you have to have the exact same digital products and industries when you do some uh, application across different uh, economies, IOTs. And you also have to have some harmonization of SUT and IOT presentation formats. Because essentially when we were looking at the data and downloading it from NSOs, there were some NSOs that presented IOTs that contained the Z matrices and effectively every matrix in the IOT that contained um, competitive imports um, as well as other things that you have to remove first. And essentially you just subtract those from the Z matrix and all the other corresponding matrices. This aggregation is also necessary 
when you have certain project groupings that contain both digital and analog. And this aggregation is covered in detail in our paper. So here's the theoretical framework that we used. So it's fundamentally rooted in the input-output analytical framework of the ONTIF. And it assumes that you did some prior aggregation of the digital industries into a single digital sector, because that will avoid double counting in your calculations, especially when your digital industries um, interact with each other in their production processes. So the mechanics of aggregating, aggregating your digital industries into a single digital sector is quite simple and it's explained in detail in our paper. So assuming you've done that, you can now um, use this equation and get an estimate of your digital GDP. And it's composed of four terms right here. So the first term right here, right here, pertains to the backward linkage of your digital sector. While the second term right here pertains to the forward linkage of your digital sector. This one is a double counted term that you need to adjust for. And it represents the contribution and dependence of the digital sector on itself for its production processes. And finally, we have the fourth term here, which represents um, fixed capital investments by the digital sectors for goods that are produced by industries that are non-digital in the same economy. So in long form, this is how your four terms look like. So when we apply, we actually apply these in two ways. So the first we use NIOTs uh, that we collected from years 2000 to 2019 and we sourced these from NSO websites. So um, quickly note that we did not have an entire series of IOTs from 2000 to 2019. Uh, NSOs produced these tables sparingly over time, but effectively we collected IOTs that fell within this time range right here. And for our GVC part of the analysis, we use YOTs. And these were nice because they, were, they had uh, lots of economies there. 43 in particular, plus the row, and 56 sectors that had enough disaggregation for us to identify what the core digital industries were, which are these three, the manufacturing of computer, electronic and optical products, telecom, as well as computer programming, consultancy, and related activities. So using NIOTs first, so when we apply our framework, the definitions and all, this is what we got. So from 2010 to 2019, in the IOTs that we collected, uh, the size of the DE actually just ranged from around 3 to 10% for all economies. And if we restrict our um, horizon to a few years, five years here, um, in level terms, the USA from 2000 to 2012 had the highest digital GDP here. In, so in um, US million dollars. And in terms of shares, US also had a high share and Germany and India joined it at the top. And if we look at 2014 to 2019 here, USA still had the highest digital GDP. And you had your three economies from before that had the highest shares still, but Taipei, China actually came into the picture with a pretty high share to economy-wide GDP of the digital sector at 9.8%. Now, if you look, if you look at growth rates computed through CGAR, uh, we actually noticed that in local currency units, the growth rate of the digital economy for almost all, just except uh, one of the economies we studied actually grew. But when we look at shares to economy-wide GDP, most of these fell. So that actually just shows you or demonstrates that uh, your economy-wide GDP uh, grew at a faster rate than the digital GDP or the digital economy. And if we disaggregate our digital economy into the four terms I showed a while ago, it's actually a toss up between the first two terms with regard to what comprised most of your digital economy. So that's either your backward linkage. So that means the, the final goods and services of the digital sector in value terms, as well as the um, total value added of your digital sector is your forward linkage. So either those two comprise most of the digital GDP that we calculated. And these are the ranges that we saw. So um, the second term pertaining to forward linkage had a higher lower and upper bound than the first term. And the third term is actually, actually had a narrow range of 20 to 27% of the total digital sector GDP. And finally, the fourth term right here for fixed capital investments had the lowest shares across all the economies we studied. And we plotted um, LCU uh, 
G digital GDP with the growth rates of economy-wide GDP. And we saw that there is initial evidence for us to um, believe that the digital sector might be enabling other industries in the economy in terms, in terms of growth, as there's a positive correlation here between the two. So using the YU tables in a global value chain analysis, using the framework by Wang Wei, Yu, and Zhu on GVC participation, we noticed that digital sectors that are more engaged in downstream activities, so these are activities that are closer to the final consumer, had higher backward and forward GVC participation rates, which isn't surprising since this is something we see even in non-digital sectors when we do GVC analysis. Perhaps it's more interesting uh, we saw that over time, although at a very gradual rate, uh, the digital sectors had a growing participation in GVCs from either a backward or a forward perspective, albeit there being the GFC in uh, 2000, 2009. So this um, persistence of uh, a growth, although in a gradual way, might be an area of empirical interest as to why that linkage was uh, persistent over time and resilient even. And we also saw using that same framework that increasing participation is most apparent in the manufacturing sector here, which is um, expected because it uses more intermediates than the other two services sectors here, as you would uh, expect. And when we use the decomposition of cross exports framework by Wang Wei, by Wang Wei and Zhu, we had these three uh, observations, general observations at least. So the first observation we had was that in terms of the gross exports of these uh, industries, um, domestic value added sources uh, were dominant uh, when compared to FVA. And we also noticed that the manufacture of computer, electronic and optical products had the most foreign value added in the digital sector, considering that we expected to have the most use of intermediates. Finally, we noticed that over time, the shares between DVA and FVA remained stable, quite stable right here. So moving forward, we will aim to produce more evidence and insights regarding the digital economy and apply it, as I said a while ago, to several themes and such as these, essentially um, internationalizing the framework as well as um, looking at the impacts of Industry 4.0, as well as how the COVID-19 pandemic might have boosted the digital economy and proven its importance to uh, this world that we live in right now. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angelo, uh, for presenting a very nice and uh, rigorous uh, measurement framework uh, of a digital economy uh, within uh, uh, SNA. I think this is very important work. And um, uh, this is also very, very uh, practically useful because now uh, COVID-19 recovery, everyone is talking about uh, digitalization of economy. So I think uh, this framework is really uh, providing a uh, uh, very important, uh, uh, you know, setup for uh, uh, rigorous uh, evidence-based uh, policy making. Thank you, thank you very much. So now our floor is already uh, open, and um, I think we can. Uh, we are running out of time, but uh, we can have uh, one round of uh, 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 question and answer. And already there are a uh, few questions, and uh, two questions uh, uh, directed to. Kenneth, and Kenneth already uh, uh, typed uh, uh, responses, but uh, uh, maybe you can recap uh, these two questions. Uh, first question is about uh, different GVC participation measures you presented, including uh, traditional conventional one, three measures, and um, uh, which one uh, is uh, better than uh, uh, other. So that's the first question. And the other one is about a little bit technical, but uh, uh, balance of payment, the uh, money are five and six, um, uh, how, how you can uh, uh, set the consistent uh, uh, data. So these two questions, probably quickly you can keep, uh, uh, okay. recap uh, your uh, response. Okay, thank you. The, with respect to which measure of participation to use, uh, as I answered there, both are useful. Although since the rear is a trade indicator, then using a measure of GVC participation that's a ratio of exports might be more intuitive than as a ratio of value added. Although, I, like I said, both are quite useful. That's why I reported both results. As for um, the issue of BPM uh, 6 and uh, whether or not it's implemented, the rear itself 
only relies on two data sets, the ADB MRIOs, for which all economies there follow the SNA 2008 framework, um, and GDP deflators. So the BPMs, the BOP data doesn't really uh, come in yet with the rear. But of course, when we correlate it with trade balances, then that's when we have to deal with BOP data. Um, as far as I know, all ADB MRIO countries um, follow BPM6. Um, so like I said there, we should be okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. So now uh, let's uh, hand over my microphone to Christina. Christina, you have, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, two questions uh, initially. Uh, one on the potential relationship between domestic agglomeration and uh, uh, competitiveness. What's the relationship? And uh, the other one is uh, broader uh, comments. Uh, uh, it's a little bit um, uh, unclear, but uh, you know, any caveats uh, uh, in interpreting uh, figures particularly a scatter diagram using uh, agglomeration uh, measures. So these two questions I could see so far. So, so why don't you spend two minutes or three minutes responding if, if you can. Okay, thank you. So a regression imply that uh, relative comparative advantage gains can be taken from increasing domestic linkages. So we see a positive relationship between the strength of domestic linkages and comparative advantage. So of course, the extent of inter-industry linkages does not have any discernible direct relationship to competitiveness. But again, in our study, what we want to value is the spillover or the multiplier effect. So it's about creating increased capabilities through these interlinkages. So we think that high domestic agglomeration within the economy could increase the spillover effects to other sectors, could increase capabilities and competitiveness, which could set the stage for national champion sectors. So this could be because strong linkages improve productivity, efficiency capabilities, and also market diversification in the domestic sectors. And then as for the caveats in doing the charts, so we've experimented how we could best show domestic agglomeration within the economy. And we think um, the dot plot matrix could be further improved, but that uh, the it, it is clear when you look at the sectors which have the main value added production activities just by looking at the size of the dots, which gave the agglomeration index. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So now um, uh, let's invite uh, uh, Angelo. Uh, I think we can start um, or we can uh, uh, post the three questions in uh, Q&A box. First one is about uh, 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 IoT or uh, SUT. Uh, on this show presentation, have you considered using a supply and user tables rather than IOTs? The SUTs are closer to the real world. So that's the first question, if you can respond. And the second question is, uh, uh, it wasn't clear uh, how you treated capital here, which is basically exogenous in the Leontief framework. Have you considered endogenizing it? Uh, interesting question. And second, uh, second question. And the third question is, uh, uh, it seems uh, you focus on ICT sectors, but not the whole digital enabled sectors like fintech. So uh, maybe, uh, you know, digital services. So these three questions, if you can respond uh, in a couple of minutes, please. Okay, very quickly. So the first one, we actually have we actually have a new DA in which we are going to uh, try to create digital SUTs as part mm -hmm. of our work, and it's uh, a work in progress. So the second question right here, in terms of um, endogenizing cross fixed capital formation, no, we did not endogenize cross fixed capital formation. We use our our hat matrices here, which get the share of um, final goods and services of other non digital industries that are purchased by the digital sector for fixed capital investments. Usually you have very disaggregated um, GFCF 
uh, made to seize for that, like that one that's produced by Canada, where we get these shares. And then finally here for the, the one regarding fintech on digitally enabled industries. Um, this is related to a question from a while ago regarding a farmer who uses robots and uh, spreadsheets mm -hmm. in her or his own production processes. We, we include this dependence in terms of the forward linkage of the digital industry, but we're not getting the full extent of that value chain because essentially the farmer's primary purpose is to produce agricultural goods and not to uh, store, process, generate digital data. Thank you, thank you very much, Angelo. And uh, Kenneth and Christina for a really uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we, uh, we run out of time, uh, but still uh, uh, we see uh, lots of uh, questions in uh, Q&A box. Uh, if you can please uh, type uh, your response in uh, Q&A box. Uh, with that, um, uh, please join me to thank a three uh, excellent presenter uh, for the uh, first section. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now uh, I'd like to hand over the microphone to uh, Joseph. Thank you very much, Dr. Sawada, for moderating the first segment uh, and also, of course, our presenters. We now proceed to the second segment of the session. It is titled Mapping Value Chains in the fast evolving global economy. May I now invite Dr. Sami al Suwaile, the Chief Economist of the Islamic Development Bank and Acting Director General of the Islamic Research and Training Institute to moderate the second segment. Dr. Sami, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Suwada, for this. Uh, and thanks all the panelists for these insightful and informative presentations. Uh, I'm sure many of the audiences now are uh, a bit uh, exhausted or maybe uh, uh, full of these uh, very uh, rich uh, presentations. So let me uh, try to uh, excite you for this session, which would be uh, uh, inshallah, as exciting as the, the first segment. Uh, we now live in a highly interconnected economic world where causes and effects are increasingly becoming local and global at the same time. And these technological advancements are not only revolutionizing products and production processes, but also dynamically transforming the economy and economic arrangements. In this context, uh, we will have two presentations in this segment. Uh, the first presentation looks at the evolution of the automotive value chain and the implications of globalization for the automotive sector. The second presentation discerns and analyzes the inter-economy and the sectoral linkages between East Asia and Latin America through the global value chain trade. So I invite uh, Mohammed. Faiz, Faiz Shah Hamid from the Islamic Development Bank for the first presentation. Mohammed is currently the head of global value chain at the Islamic Development Bank. He pioneered a novel method for country development strategy by shifting from conventional growth strategies to a holistic global value chain approach to identify targeted interventions and projects with highest development impact. He is also well experienced in international trade and investment by leading many trade and investment agreement negotiations, namely the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. His research interests also include international trade, investment, FDI, global value chains, and industrial policy. Over to you, Mohammed. Thank you very much, Dr. Sami. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me as a panelist for this session. My name is Mohamed Faiz Shaul Hamid, and I'm the head of Global Value Chains at the Islamic Development Bank. The theme of the webinar today is measuring economic globalization. Before we go into my presentation, I would like to highlight a few points for us to ponder upon. Uh, what we measure must enable us to predict and prediction is at the heart of making important policy decisions under uncertainty. Prediction only becomes powerful when we collect the right data and have the correct tools to do it. We have been discussing about the tools and data, which is very important, but in a globalized world that we live in today, we 
face uh, two biggest challenges, I would say. Uh, the first challenge is a huge gap between the use of statistics and evidence-based strategy and policy. The gap between the statistics and the policy is very huge. In ISDB, we are trying to fill in this gap to support our member countries. The second challenge uh, is the linkage between different sets of data and emerging sets of data. We know today that data is a new oil. Several new sources of data may support better prediction. One example is during COVID-19, when all uh, car factories in the automotive industries lowered the input the recovery in production was measured using satellite data on number of cars usually parked in different facilities. So this is one example of how integration of data might require us to rethink how we make predictions on policies and strategies. Having said that, I'm happy to share ISDB's GVC strategy in which we try to fill in the gap from statistics to evidence evidence-based uh, policy that I hope will be useful uh, for all of you in this webinar. The outline of my presentation today, uh, I'll start off by talking about the ISDB GVC based strategy. Um, then I'll speak a little bit on uh, how do we move from IO tables to practical targeted interventions. And finally, I'll speak and summarize uh, the paper, The Evolving Global Automotive Value Chain. As I mentioned earlier, one of the impeding factors in making accurate prediction is data and tools. For the past 70 to 80 years, we estimate the economy at country or national level, but the global economy is shaped by globalized industries and businesses. We often fail to connect with the real economy. Realizing these blind spot and the needs of our member countries, uh, the new ISDB business model is centered around the global value chain strategy. Uh, in the new business model of ISDB country level engagement, which is called the member country pa partnership strategy, works hand in hand with industry level interventions. Due to the mandates of MDBs that sometimes uh, they focus uh, on the level of exposures, on risk, uh, and so on and so forth, the lands at country level, sometimes we often miss out the trend and interlinkage with industry. Um, having this complementary effort between um, the country level engagement and also the industry level engagement supports more targeted interventions that will enable us to support the real economy. So at the country level, we use the GVC lenses to identify interventions in two targeted industries with the aim of creating uh, new jobs or quality jobs and increase the value added in the industry. This is supported with uh, industry touch, uh, which enables us to understand the trends in the industry, such as the transition towards sustainability, uh, the opportunities of new market access uh, or sourcing, as well as bringing all actors to one platform. Uh, it would also require uh, a buy-in from all stakeholders uh, and this is where the beauty of this strategy is because it requires all stakeholders such as the value chain actors which are multilateral corporations, national champions, private players, all of them to come together with the financing actors, with the government, be it the federal, the national government uh, or even the state or municipality to come together to address the constraints in the targeted industry. In this way, we have a more holistic transformation that addresses the needs of the country as well as the need, needs of the industries. Next, as we move into the use of IO tables in our analysis, uh, IO tables play an important link and role in understanding the complex interlinkages in an economy from GVC perspective. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the use of IO table is to target and find industries with highest potential, which would enable us to find industry that can suitably access the GVC, uh, find industry with potential upgrading, and find interlinkages between different industries and sectors to ensure spillover effect. Uh, the outcome that we target uh, out of uh, this exercise 
is to have a narrowed down industry to ensure maximum development impact uh, and also to pick an industry with lower investment risk and also to identify blind spots uh, for value add improvements. Uh, the indicators we use uh, essentially uh, differ according to the country and also the industry that uh, we target. However, some of the indicators that we use uh, most commonly is domestic value added, uh, foreign value added, indirect value add, GVC participation index, GVC position index, and also some other decomposition that's done uh, quite manually. And I think the ADB MRI uh, is a, a set of database that really uh, it's very useful for us as well. And uh, we have used it as well uh, for some of our countries. Let's now move uh, to the paper itself, uh, which is titled The Evolving Global Automotive Value Chain Analysis of Economic Value Added. As the title of the paper suggests, uh, the global automotive value chain is in the brink of greatest transformation. The biggest transformation is happening uh, with the move from internal combustion engine uh, to electric vehicles, ICE to EVs. Uh, when cars were first produced, it was not only uh, the 1.5 trillion global trade of vehicles that we have today, but it was built upon an entire ecosystem uh, and infrastructure that was built for the internal combustion engine vehicles, ICE vehicles, um, which includes you know, the petrol infrastructure, the services, the technology that came with it. So all these, the entire ecosystem was built on the ICE uh, based industry. But today when we are moving towards electric vehicle, there is a huge vulnerability in the different parts of the automotive value chain especially for different production locations. So this study uh, looks into the top 15 car producing countries and looks at which countries will be most vulnerable in this move towards EV adoption as the entire ecosystem that is built upon the ICE will be transformed to the EV ecosystem. And perhaps there will be a gradual change However, this change is already happening and some of the trends that we are seeing uh, from the automakers is that despite the slow adoption of electric vehicles, which stands at only about 2% globally, the EV adoption has gained a lot of traction, particularly during COVID-19. This is because the pandemic has accelerated the need to reorganize the global production network where the debate is between building resilience versus efficiency. As a result, we have seen huge flows of capital to the EV market uh, and challenging the traditional car makers. From a market capitalization perspective alone, uh, the market capitalization by, for example, Tesla uh, is about $750 billion now, which is a total of all market capitalization of the top 10 traditional car makers put together, uh, such as you know Toyota, uh, Volkswagen, BMW, Hyundai, and Ford, all the market capitalization of the top 10 traditional car makers is equivalent to the market capitalization of Tesla. So there's a lot of flow of capital uh, to the electric vehicle space. So the speed of this change is also quite disruptive as this sevenfold increase in market capitalization happened within only one year and traditional car makers uh, took at least you know 40 to 50 years or even 100 years uh, to build upon the brand and the consumer base uh, for for the internal combustion engine vehicles so this is really something that is transforming the entire global automotive industry. And this can also be explained by uh, some policies uh, by the largest global markets uh, towards renewables, uh, such as the adoption of uh, the EU uh, policies towards uh, renewables and greenhouse gas emissions, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and also by the US uh, and China. 
So as a result, uh, what does this mean for the industry? First, uh, we see that the value added from traditional ICE-based value chain will shrink. So countries that have domestically uh, driven value add will be less vulnerable as there will be more control on domestic policies uh, in the move towards EV. Second, uh, the current value chain set up at tier 1 up to tier 3 suppliers in the industry may be wiped out as uh, many parts and mechanical parts in the ICE ecosystem will be replaced completely. Um, and given the fact that tier 2 and tier 3 uh, uh, suppliers are more vulnerable because of the fact that they are small and medium-sized enterprises, and also at the same time they, ha they have been facing a lot of working capital issues, uh, especially given the setup of how uh, effi the efficient setup and just-in-time setup of the automotive value chain, we can see that during COVID-19, most of the Tier 2 and Tier 3 suppliers have been hit very badly uh, during COVID-19. And we see that this trend may continue if there is a move towards uh, the move towards uh, EV uh, and also the ecosystem that's built up, um, uh, with EV uh, happens very rapidly. And these tier two and tier three players uh, would really have uh, a huge consequence on them. So third um, is the fact that the location with longer production length, uh, which means uh, the number of times a product is traveling cross border may become uh, costlier. And as uh, the new value chain setup, of course, uh, will adopt a more resilient value chain in my opinion and uh, rather than just in time. So we have also been seeing that uh, most of these new electric vehicle uh, players have been focusing uh, the setup of their production to have 70 to 80% of the production to be done internally without, um, without having a very uh, broken down value chain um, or supplier based uh, system that we had before in the ICE based uh, value chain. So this is all going to really transform the entire industry. Next I would like to explain a little bit on the method uh, that we use uh, which is mainly uh, the decomposition of the uh, input output table to analyze uh, from three different angles. So what is different uh, with the approach that we, we took is that uh, we look at the uh, processes in the GVC and we try to match it with the value added decomposition. So matching the value chain processes and actors with the value added decomposition. So the angle that we always use uh, in terms of decomposition has always, uh, in, in my humble opinion, is that we have always been focusing in terms of um, how it has impact for trade. We look at the trade aspects um, of cross-border trade. But, uh, but uh, what, we, what I was trying to do here in this study is that to have a decomposition uh, by by breaking down the different processes in the value chain. So we match the processes with the decomposed value add. So the, the first angle that we are looking at is the decomposition uh, in production of final products to domestic market directly. So this is the local OEM production because when you produce the vehicle um, in the country and then it's domestically absorbed uh, in the economy uh, means that it was the local OEM production, which is uh, the assembly line uh, from any car manufacturer in the country uh, that is then absorbed directly. So the final product is absorbed directly in the economy. So this means that in, uh, in this first aspect, what we are trying to see is that we are trying to see whether um, the value added is domestically driven or externally driven. And then uh, the further decomposition that we use uh, is on the supplier exports, um, uh, as you can see in the second uh, part that uh, is highlighted in red. So this second part, um, essentially uh, supplier exports uh, is, is decomposed from the, uh, from the value added, is decomposed to supplier exports. Uh, and 
what's what's uh, interesting is that we already have a breakdown uh, by the absorption at uh, by a direct importer or the absorption by uh, a re-export exercise which is called simple GVCs and complex GVCs. So we can match this with the tier 1 suppliers for the simple GVCs because tier 1 suppliers essentially are going to export the uh, parts and components um, or the sub-assembly models uh, to the uh, assembler which is the OEM so there's only one cross-border um, cross-border that happens or one cross-border exercise that happens here and then in terms of re-export uh, for complex GVCs tier 2 suppliers are sending to a tier 1 supplier in another country and the tier 1 supplier is then assembling uh, the component and sending it to uh, a local OEM or OEM that is based somewhere else. So we get to break this down to tier one and tier two suppliers. So this decomposition gives us some idea about how the buyers of tier two and tier one supplier uh, may have uh, may, may can cause some vulnerability because we have discussed earlier how tier two suppliers have been affected during the pandemic. And then the third part of uh, the study looks into the production length. And the production length is essentially uh, focused on intra-industry production from a backward linkage perspective. So how many times, uh, you know, the parts and components uh, that arrive in a production location uh, crosses borders. So this has many implications. And uh, one of the implications is, for example, um, the cost, uh, increase in cost, financial cost, uh, or during some economic shock, there could be also a logistical costs increase. Uh, there, there could be risk in terms of financial costs. And all these can happen uh, due to the rearrangement of any value chain. So a longer production length will be more vulnerable. So this is the case that we tried to build based on these three different aspects. Now I would like to share some of the findings and results of the study. Uh, I would like to perhaps summarize these findings and results as I believe that most of you already have my paper and you can refer to it. Um, so some of uh, the main finding, uh, first of all, is that uh, domestically driven production location will be least vulnerable to shocks, while externally driven countries will be most vulnerable. Uh, however, there are some exceptions uh, for country like China, which has a long uh, backward linkage uh, production length, uh, which uh, may result in short-term shocks uh, to the auto industry. For the externally driven production locations such as France, Turkey and Czech Republic, uh, they, will, they will be more vulnerable to, due to value add that is mainly derived from tier 2 suppliers. With the issues on working capital, especially during COVID, uh, many tier two actors have been negatively affected and these countries are more affected than the rest. In terms of uh, production length, um, the production locations uh, from East Asian countries, which are China, Japan and Korea have a longer production length and given the longer production length, uh, such as uh, in these countries, uh, they are more vulnerable uh, to supply side shocks. This is very evident in the past two weeks, uh, especially when there is a shortage of chips uh, for vehicles. So uh, the shortage of chips, for example, in this scenario uh, will have huge impact to the countries, which has higher production uh, length from a backward linkage perspective. Uh, so that's, that's just one example. But in the longer term, also, there, there will be uh, you know, uh, because of the more frequent cross-border movement uh, that uh, that is experienced by the backward linkage value chain of these countries, uh, these countries are also more vulnerable to financial and economic shocks compared to other countries like Germany, France, United States, and Mexico, where their production length is way shorter. So um, China, Korea, and Japan is also expected to have greater supply-side vulnerabilities due to the longer production length. So both value added of Korea and Japan, um, although they are externally driven, um, you know, uh, which makes them actually even more vulnerable to shocks from the demand side, um, 
Japan and Korea also um, have a very efficient automotive value chain set up with the lowest cost and they have OEMs that is spread around the world. Um, uh, however, in this kind of situation um, during COVID-19, um, this setup was uh, not the most uh, resilient setup uh, in terms of uh, shocks in the economy. Uh, so these countries' uh, production locations in different parts of the world has worked against uh, the these countries as well. So despite the emerging trends of the global automotive value chain that may become shorter and with shorter production length, the emergence of new production hubs and based on market seeking activities and entire consolidation of suppliers and move towards EV uh, in the short to medium term, uh, the study sees that there's no middle ground between resilience and efficiency in terms of the value chain unless these new emerging trends consider a new governance system in the supplier buyer relationship in the global automotive industry. So the consequence of this evolving global automotive value chain will have actually a very huge impact on the global economy. And this is something that we need to consider because uh, the automotive industry employs uh, many people, especially when we talk about tier two and tier three industry and the transition from the ecosystem that is based on ICE which is which has some level of labor intensity and the move towards uh, you know more aut autonomous uh, and also more uh, mechanization in the entire value chain that is based on the EV uh, value chain may have a huge impact uh, to jobs to value add from different production locations and this may have a huge consequence uh, in terms of the global economy. So it is important for us uh, to try um, to quickly um, adapt and swiftly uh, find a balance between resilience and efficiency and also uh, to, to ensure that uh, the new ecosystem that's built upon uh, the new uh, electric vehicle value chain is inclusive and the transition that happens uh, from ICE to EV uh, actually does not really um, affect the development of most of the countries in these production locations. So uh, as a result, uh, I think uh, this study uh, was enabled us to view uh, how exactly uh, the ecosystem uh, from ICE to EV would have vulnerabilities to certain production locations and uh, in the end, uh, we, we think that it is important to, uh, for countries and uh, for automakers to have a transition mindset, mindset when all this is happening and also have policy and strategies that will allow uh, the current uh, value chain actors uh, to survive and to enable them to, uh, to be part of the new value chain as well. So uh, I hope that this study was very useful and my sharing was very useful to all of you. Thank you very much, Mohammed, uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, we appreciate it. And now, because we are running out of time, we will move to our uh, Last speaker and presenter in Arabic, we say which means we conclude or we have uh, a musk seal. I don't know if I, I correctly, correctly translated the, the, the wording, but anyhow, uh, uh, maybe this would be the, the most, inshallah, best part of the presentation. Witada Anoku Wataka from the United Nations Economic and Social Commissions for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, she, is, she leads the research of capacity building initiatives on trade and investment policies, global value chains, regional integration and digital trade policies at ISCAP. Recently, she has led the ECLAC SCAP joint project sponsored by FEALAC. And don't ask me what these abbreviations are for on enhancing the Asia LAC integration through value chain development. 
and she also led the research initiatives on Asia Pacific digital trade regulatory restrictiveness. So, uh, with that, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Vithada Anukulnataka from SCAM. I would like to thank the organizers, the Asian Development Bank and Islamic Development Bank for the opportunity to present some results from SCAP's research on economic integration between Asia Pacific and Latin America. In this research, we utilize MRIO tables courtesy by ADB to estimate trade in value added flows between the two regions. This research is part of the ECLAC SCAP joint project funded by the Forum for East Asia Latin America Cooperation of VLAC. My discussion today will focus on two main points. First, I look at what are the major differences in the two regions if we look through the GVC lens. Second, I look at how the two regions integrate with each other through value chains development. Throughout my discussion, I will refer to two terminologies describing GVC participation. The two terms are backward linkages and forward linkages. Backward linkages is the term used from an importer's perspective. It measures how much a country need imported input in their export production. Forward linkages look from an exporter's perspective. It is referred to how much a country contributes to other countries' exports by sending inputs used in export production of that partner country. Now, let me bring to you what we found in the data. The first highlight fact about the two region differences from the perspective of economic integration is intra-regional economic linkage is much stronger in Asia Pacific than in Latin America. As we can see on the left hand side, intra-regional exports account nearly 45% of total export in Asia Pacific. On the right hand side, it shows that in Latin America, North America is the most important destination. Second, we see a symmetry of inter-regional relationship. Asia Pacific is an important export market for Latin America, but Latin America is a tiny export market for Asia. As is shown on the graph, Latin America export to Asia are equivalent to 20% of Latin America total exports. But for Asia Pacific, only 5% of Asian exports went to Latin America. Next, we look at foreign value added. It shows us also evidence of relationship imbalance. The data show that Latin America used quite significant amount of inputs from Asia in their export production, especially in their export to North America. You can see in the next slide that this is driven by manufacturing assembly in Mexico. The data here show value added sent from Asia account over 10% in the value of Latin America's export to North America. On the opposite, value added by Latin America account less than 1% of Asia export to any region. We also found that the majority of Asia imports from Latin America end up in consumption within Asian region, not for exports. The two regions relationships through GVC are clearly dominated by Mexico on the left and China on the right. It is in a way that Mexico imports intermediates from Asia for the export production. 
China is the major exporter of those intermediate, followed by Japan and Republic of Korea. The pattern on the left also shows the differences of Mexico from other LAC countries. We can see that, except Mexico, LAC are more with forward linkages than backward linkages. These patterns seem to be because they participate through exporting raw materials from primary commodity sector and mining sector. Although it is to be noted that, with the exception of Brazil, Chile, and Peru, these forward linkages are very small in absolute value. For Asia, which is on the right, the pattern has more variety. There are economies with relatively high forward linkages because supplying parts and components. These are such as Japan, Republic of Korea, China, and Taiwan province of China. And there are economies supplying commodities and fuel such as Indonesia, Russia, and Russian Federation. In Asia, there are also economies with 90% backward linkages, such as Vietnam and Singapore, but they are totally different in nature of participation in GVC if we dig deeper at country level. In short, what was seen here is the product of diversity in Asia than in Latin America, which may partly explain why intra-regional trade in Asia is more significant than Latin America, as shown in the early slide. Now, let's examine how forward linkages the two regions have with each other. It will show how each region contributes to GVC related export by the other region. From the figures, we can see that Asia Pacific is an important destination for Latin America's forward linkages, which are driven by mining export from Latin America, for manufacturing intermediate export from Asia, especially parts and components of electrical equipment sector. However, to Asia, Latin America as well as North America are small export markets for their intermediate. This pattern seems to reflect the less integration of production networks in Asia with America's continent than the integration within Asia and with Europe. It is also interesting to see on the left-hand side that Latin America is connected with Asia through exporting business service used in Asian value chain. The relationship through service sector would be very interesting to explore further when more disaggregate service data become available. In the next slide, we will see which countries are the major contributors to forward linkages between Latin America and Asia Pacific regions. Here, we can see on the left hand side, Brazil is distinctly the largest contributor accounting for 41% of total Latin American content in Asian GVC exports. Similarly, on the right hand side, Asia Pacific has China contributing more than others to Asian content used in Latin America's GVC exports. The share of China is 43% of total Asian content in the exports going out from Latin America to the world. What exactly these dominant economies are contributing to value chains in each other region? To answer, we will need to dig deeper to find evidence at country level. Here, we examine the pattern of forward linkages across major contributors in this slide. The pattern is quite interesting, especially in Latin America. As shown on the left, we find that general perception about Latin America-Asia relationships as mining for manufacturing 
is whole for most Latin America except for Brazil. Brazil seems to link with Asian value chain through diverse sectors. Brazil has agriculture and mining account for about half of the country's forward linkages with Asia. Interestingly, Brazil has other business activities as also an important connecting point with Asia. As revealed on the left-hand side of this slide, when we look deeper into other business activities export from Latin America to Asia value chains, it is clear that 88% of business services are export by Brazil. What is found here seems to be consistent with findings from anecdotal evidence. Through case studies, ESCAP has found several of Brazil's success stories in exporting of technical and professional service to Asian value chain. For example, Brazil exports technical service related to agricultural technology such as in producing ethanol and animal breeding. Brazil also exports service related to agricultural machinery, video gaming, data analytics in the construction and mining industries, and also exporting service related to e-commerce platform. To see evidence at country level, let me bring to you some useful visualizations from rewa.negotiatetrade.org, which is a user-friendly online tool that ESCAP has developed for supporting evidence-based policy making. The dedicated sections on global value chain in RIVA provide indicators that ESCAP estimate based on underlying data from ADB MRIO. Here, we want to see how Brazil's forward linkages look like. So, we go to forward linkages subsection in RIVA and we select Brazil in the drop down menu. And we select the latest data year which is 2017. Here is the result shown in Riva. It shows Brazil's forward linkages with the world in 2017. We can see that Asia-Pacific economies, all in blue, are the most important region for Brazil's forward linkages export. In fact, China is the most important market for Brazil's forward linkages the country accounts for 11% or around $6 billion of the total forward linkages which Brazil exports to the world. As you may remember, we see Brazil is the sole actor exporting business service from Latin America to Asia. So we want to see deeper in this area. We select uh, other business service in the drop down menu of exporting sector under Brazil. It reveals that global value chains in Singapore is the most important market for Brazil's export of business service. Singapore accounts for about 40% of Brazil business service forward linkages with the world. India and China follow with the share of 10% each. Overall, Asia Pacific region in blue account about two thirds of Brazil business service exports in GBC. With most of it goes to three countries, Singapore, India, and China. Then, we trace and compare how Brazil's business service went into value chains in Singapore, India, and China. The results shown here indicate that Singapore and India absorb the majority of Brazil business service through their service value chains, such as transport service and trading service. In contrast, 
70% of business service from Brazil that went into China end up in Chinese manufacturing value chains. Now, let's return to Asia. If you can still remember, we have already seen earlier that China is the dominant contributor of Asian forward linkages with Latin America. And electrical equipment is the most important sector, accounting around 38% of Asia's contribution to Latin America value chains. Here, we explore further and found that 58% of those electrical equipment forward linkages from Asia to Latin America come from just one country, which is China. The evidence so far point out that if we want to understand how Asia is contributing to Latin America value chains, the most natural starting point is to look at what China is exporting to Latin America value chains. So we return to forward linkages subsection in Riva and we select China in the drop down menu. Here, Riva shows that although the share of forward linkages with Latin America region, which is in green, is relatively small, the forward linkages that China has with Mexico as an Indian market is actually significant. In fact, Mexico is the fourth largest market for China's forward linkages behind Republic of Korea, Germany, and Netherlands. Mexico accounts for nearly 5% of China's total forward linkages with the world. The importance of Mexico in China's forward linkages export to the world is even clearer when we select electrical equipment in the drop-down menu. In fact, Mexico is the largest individual destination for China export of electrical equipment forward linkages. Mexico account for 10% of China total forward linkages in this particular sector. We trace further where do the parts and components of electrical equipment from China went into value chains in Mexico. We found that 77% of those parts from China landed in Mexico's export of electrical equipment. Another 15% embedded in Mexico's export of transport equipment. Most of them become China's indirect export to North America via Mexico. Let me summarize. Evidence from tracing MRIO tables confirm that first, there is asymmetric TV relationships between Asia Pacific and Latin America. Second, mining for manufacturing is a general description for Latin America Asia relationships. The main driver is Asia Pacific, especially China, is exporting manufacturing intermediates to Mexico while importing commodities from the Latin America region. Third, to Latin America, although mining remains a dominant part of the region's GBC participation with Asia, new opportunities seem to emerge for selected economies. The opportunity lies especially in business service. This may require more disaggregate service data in MRI tables to better capture the new dynamics. Lastly, to Asia Pacific, forward linkages with Latin America, especially with Mexico, has allowed Asian economies to export indirectly to North America. However, whether the pattern could remain under the nearshoring pressure is yet to be seen. Thank you very much for your attention. More information is available from river.negotiatrade.org. Thank you very much, uh, Witada, for your interesting and informative uh, presentation. Uh, we are unfortunately running out of time. We received a couple of interesting questions, 
but the presenters were kind enough to answer these questions directly in the Q&A. Uh, I hope this would be uh, helpful. Uh, with this, uh, we conclude this segment. Over to you, Joseph. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sami, for moderating the second part. And of course, we will take questions and, uh, in the chat box and also via email, and then we'll be able to answer, uh, provide a far more comprehensive responses to all your questions. Uh, so we are down to the closing. So for now, uh, uh, let me invite Dr. Arif Suleiman, Director for the Economic Research and Statistics of the Islamic Research and Training Institute for the closing remarks on behalf of the Islamic Development Bank. Uh, Dr. Arif, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joseph. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening from Jeddah. I would like to thank you all for joining us from across the globe this morning, afternoon, very late evening in Manila. Your active participation in the seminar on measuring economic globalization beyond trade has contributed to its success. As the world becomes increasingly interconnected, and transactions in intermediates dominate international trade, we need to gain a deeper understanding of the economics of GVCs than what is afforded today by standard trade statistics and analysis. In the seminar, besides presenting trade statistics based analyses, we have explored, albeit briefly, real effective exchange rates, agglomeration, and digitalization, three factors that will have increasing implications for globalization in a world redefined by the COVID-19 pandemic. Given the endeavors of the global statistical community under the auspices of the UNSC to develop a framework for measuring economic globalization, our objective today was to highlight certain measurement issues that we are currently grappling with. As underscored by Drs. Mansour and Sami in their brief interventions, enhancing GVC participation is a strategic priority of the Islamic Development Bank in its quest to foster sustainable economic development and growth in our member countries. In addition, uh, Dr. Fires has mentioned in his intervention the operational relevance of statistical compilation and economic analysis being undertaken and the importance of evidence-based decision-making. Given the multifacetedness and complexity of the GVC phenomenon, its local and global implications, we have partnered with the Asian Development Bank to synergize our knowledge resources and efforts to produce knowledge solutions, which are also geared towards supporting our respective strategic goals as MDBs. As evident from the seminar, our two organizations are working with other multilateral institutions, including the UNSCAP, uh, UNECLAC, and would welcome additional collaboration from other institutions in this very important area of economic globalization. Moving forward, we have also planned a series of events for knowledge exchange and capacity building at both the local and global levels. And I would like to extend an invitation to one and all to reach out to us if you have any questions or would like to participate in some of the knowledge exchange and capacity development initiatives that we have planned. I want to take this opportunity to thank the UNSC for providing us with the platform and opportunity to discuss, me to discuss measurement issues in subject matter areas which are topical, yet currently outside the frontiers of standard statistical frameworks. I also want to express my sincere appreciation to the teams at the Asian Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, the UNSC, who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes and provided superb logistics and administrative support for this event, especially given the current circumstances. Last but not least, the special word of thanks to the economists and statisticians at the ISDB and ADB for their hard work and initiatives in developing complex data frameworks and employing cutting edge analytical methods to produce statistics and, 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 and analysis that are critical to gain a deeper understanding of the global economic, uh, economic globalization phenomenon. I want to thank you once again. We look forward to seeing you all pretty soon. Take care, stay safe, and salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Joseph, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Arif. Uh, now, uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Elaine Tan, advisor to the chief economist and the head of the statistics and data innovation unit of ADB, for the closing remarks on behalf of the Asian Development Bank. Uh, so, Elaine, over to you. 
Thank you, Joseph. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time and your participation in this seminar on statistics of globalization, development and analysis on GDCs. We encourage you to contact us, not only to provide feedback on the papers presented, but also to get more detailed information on ongoing research projects in statistics and economics. In this regard, let me take this opportunity to share with you our recent and ongoing initiatives in the economic globalization domain and our upcoming knowledge products. Our main statistical product is the Marriott or multi-regional IO tables. It is an inter-country input-output tables framework, which systematically details the production technologies, consumption patterns, trade linkages, and value creation of economies within the global economic system. Using Marriott's, we also produce statistics indicators and analyses on the global value chains, or GVCs. Marriott's and the statistics derived from them have been a key statistical tool used by many international agencies to understand our biggest challenge today, which is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Research on various topics have been conducted last year, including topics such as how the flow of goods and services were disrupted by lockdowns, the impact of the pandemic on trade finance, and how youth unemployment will increase due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to the increasing importance of merits and GVCs, we will also feature them as a supplement in our upcoming flagship statistical publication, namely the key indicators for Asia and the Pacific. In the GVC supplement, we will undertake an in-depth detailed study at the product level on one country's trade patterns, as well as the impact of COVID-19 on those patterns. ADB's merits and GVCs are also regularly featured in the Global Value Chain Development Report, which is an international publication supported by a consortium of multilateral and academic institutions. And together with our colleagues, the Islamic Development Bank, we have recently published a report on Indonesia's participation on GDCs, and later this year, we'll be publishing similar studies on Brunei Darussalam, Malaysia, Pakistan, and Singapore. The team will also be exploring the use of big data in the compilation of economic statistics, in particular to improve trade estimates using maritime transport data. Before concluding this seminar, I would like to thank the UNSC for giving us the opportunity and platform to discuss issues at the cutting edge of economic statistics. Also, very special thanks to our teams at ADB and ISDB for excellent organization and logistical support. Once again, on behalf of the Asian Development Bank, thank you for all your cooperation and participation we look forward to seeing you in future such events on economic globalization statistics. Thank you. Back to you, Joseph. Well, thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, so with that, uh, we conclude our side event on uh, measuring economic globalization. And uh, we thank you again for joining us in this webinar. You may visit uh, our website uh, for uh, all the papers presented. Uh, plus, you can always email us your questions and comments, and we will get back to you with detailed responses. And of course, we certainly appreciate uh, your uh, participation in our future seminars and events and uh, research work. So on behalf of the Asian Development Bank, uh, the, uh, the Islamic Development Bank, and our presenters, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, hopefully, we will see you all soon uh, in a future GVC-related event. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>